Hi folks, welcome to my third video on the IB 2020 results and a dive into their fairness on an individual basis. I'm a teacher in small town Canada and amongst other things I teach IB mathematics. So in this video we're going to look at whether having a correct distribution implies that individual scores have been correctly assigned. In other words, if say 24% of students get a 4, how sure are we that the correct 24% of students got that grade? Before we get to that, I'm sure people are aware that there's an appeals process that schools can undertake to have student scores revisited on an individual, subject, or even whole cohort basis. There are guidelines and conditions for those appeals which are known to school-based program coordinators, and I'll throw a link in the description below. For this reason, and for the reasons I've outlined in other videos, I really think that university admissions officers should consider waiting before making decisions about discounting IB students based on their conditional offers. If they're unable to wait, consider deferring to predicted grades, seeking out school-based grades, or just showing a little bit of leniency because this situation around IB grades is unfolding. If you're not in the loop on how IB grades were determined this year, check out my first video on the topic. I'll put a link in the video description. Okay, to the matter at hand. I've heard a fair bit recently from IB and from commenters that the grades this year follow a similar distribution to grades last year and that this indicates that the grades this year are fair. And that raises a great mathematical question. Does having a good distribution, whatever you consider that to be, indicate that the individual scores have been assigned correctly? For the record, I'm not saying that all the distributions are for sure appropriate this year. The IB has always had more of a focus on criterion referenced assessment than norm referenced assessment. In other words, it grades students on their achievement against syllabus outcomes, not on their achievement against each other. But for the sake of engaging with the recurring comment of, hard to argue with that bell curve, let's assume that these distributions are correct or at least reasonable. We'll dive into this in the context of the May 2020 Math SL results, um, but if you're inclined to get the TLDR version, here it is. Creating a correct distribution and ensuring that the right scores are correctly assigned to each individual are related tasks but of vastly different orders of difficulty. Okay, on to the numbers. Here are the stats from the 2020 Math SL results from the published statistical bulletin and the links in the video description. They're published as percentages and here's the distribution. There were 50,759 candidates, so the grade distribution as people would be this. Let's take a look at those distributions. So here it is as percentages, and here it is as actual people. You can see that the distribution is the same, it's just that the scale is different. So the distribution looks aesthetically pleasing, and one might be tempted to say that it is indeed the quote-unquote correct distribution. But there are lots of ways to get there. So let's imagine a sample student, Andy from Arkansas. And Andy could get a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, a 6, or a 7. And we could still get this grade distribution. As long as 914 students get a 1 and 5,736 get a 2, we're going to get this distribution. So how many ways could 50,759 students create this exact distribution? Don't worry, it's not a rhetorical question. The answer is 4.95 times 10 to the power of 39,140. Now sometimes scientific notation makes it difficult for us to grasp the actual size of a number. So here's that number, 4.95 times 10 to the 39,140. Here it is written out in 11 point font. And so there's the first page of it, and the second, and the third, and fourth, and fifth, and so on. That's how big that number is. Okay. Now for a point of reference, Numberphile recently estimated the number of particles in the universe. 
this is how big that number is. So again, number of ways to create this distribution, number of particles in the universe. So there you have it. There's an unimaginably large number of ways to come up with that distribution. And it's a fair counterpoint that some of those ways include wildly unlikely scenarios where everybody who should get a 1 gets a 7. So even if you believe that the distribution is correct, we're still a long way from establishing correct assignment of scores. How far away? Well, about this far away. So no, the distribution itself is not a strong argument that scores have been correctly assigned on an individual basis. And remember that the grades themselves were created by an algorithm that the IB isn't sharing with anyone. For some reason, the onus seems to be on students and teachers to demonstrate cases of unreasonableness, rather than the IB communicating transparently why its algorithm is reasonable. So, in that spirit, I'm going to show you how I came up with this number, so you don't have to just take my word for it. Before we get to that, though, I think it's worth mentioning the frustration that some teachers are feeling around this. Uh, the website tes.com has been doing a series of articles on the 2020 results. And in the comments section of one article, a further maths HL teacher, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Christos Nikolaidis, outlines his experiences with this year's grading system and the responses he's received. He does an excellent job of communicating his experience, so I won't read out his whole comments, uh, but I'll throw the link in the video description and look for his name in those comments. Okay, on to the mathematics. There's a counting property that says if you have n objects where a are alike of one kind, meaning they're indistinguishable from each other, and then b are alike of another kind, and c are alike of another kind, and so on, then the number of ways of arranging all the objects is given by this little formula. Now that exclamation point means a factorial, and factorial just means multiply down. So if you had like 5 factorial, it means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Multiply down to 1, and that would give you 120. 1 factorial is 1, and as a special property, 0 factorial is also 1. So a classic example of how to use this might be to find all the different ways that you can rearrange the letters in the word Mississippi. So notice that Mississippi has 11 letters, and it has 1 M, it has 4 S's, and those S's are indistinguishable from each other, even though I haven't drawn them very well. It has 4 I's that are all the same. So if I flipped where this eye is and this eye is, it wouldn't make any difference to what the word looks like. And lastly, we've got two p's. If we apply this formula, our n would be 11. So we've got 11 factorial, okay, right up here. We'd have one alike of one kind, so we could say one factorial for our m's. We have four alike of s's, so that's four factorial. We have four alike of i's. So there's our s's, there's our i's. And we have two alike of our p's. And I can just throw that in a decent calculator, and it's going to tell me that the number of ways that we can arrange all the letters of the word Mississippi is 34,650. And this all comes out of something called the fundamental counting principle. So now imagine all the 50,759 students in Math SL are arranged in a line, and they're each going to get a grade. 914 of them will receive a 1, and every grade of 1 is indistinguishable from every other grade of 1. Nobody says, hey, you take my 1 and I'll take yours. So if we use this formula, this would be our n, our 50,759. Let me make a little room here. So the number of ways that we can arrange things is going to come from 50,759 factorial, there are 914 indistinguishable ones. They're alike. There are 5,736 indistinguishable twos. So we just keep on going with this. So I just barely managed to squeeze it in, but we now have an expression for all the different ways we could arrange this distribution of grades. 
So at this point, it's pretty easy. I just type that all into my calculator and I press enter and oh no, it says overflow. Now what that means is that the number is too big for my calculator to be able to deal with. Now we might be able to use logs or some other tricks to strong arm this calculator into giving us some version of the answer, but let's just head over to Wolfram Alpha instead. At this point, the issue isn't one of properly setting up the question, but just a brute computational force or sneaky techniques. So you can see I put the expression in and voila, 4.95 times 10 to the power of 39,140 is our answer. And the process was pretty transparent. All right, that's it for me for now. I hope you had fun playing with large numbers. And take care, everyone.